Hey guys, thanks for choosing to hang out with me this week. This week's video is a viewer suggestion from Michael. We're going to be discussing the murder of Dylan Redwine. Dylan was a young boy from Colorado who unfortunately had his life cut short by someone close to him. This story is tragic and honestly there was no reason for this situation to even occur. This case is currently ongoing, I mean as of this month the perpetrator was just convicted. So I felt like it was very relevant to go ahead and discuss this while it was ongoing. But as always, I invite you to join me as we discuss this terrible situation. So sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Dylan Redwine was born on February 6, 1999 to his parents Mark and Elaine Redwine. He had three older siblings between both parents since Mark was previously married. Dylan was described as an outgoing child who had a passion for sports. Around the time Dylan entered his preteen years, his parents filed for divorce and began going through an intensely contested custody case regarding Dylan. He lived with his mother full-time in Colorado Springs, but had court-mandated visits with his father, who lived six hours away in Bayfield, Colorado. As Dylan grew older, he expressed being upset with his father and stated he did not want to visit him since Mark made him feel uncomfortable. But despite his protest, Elaine had no choice due to the custody arrangement. With the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday, Dylan was forced to pack up and fly out to Mark's home. On November 18th of 2012, Dylan arrived in Bayfield and was picked up by his father. The pair made a quick stop at Walmart and grabbed dinner at McDonald's before heading to Mark's home about 30 minutes away. Dylan texted his mother to let her know he had made it safely and was with his father. He also touched base with a friend named Ryan, making plans to come over at 6.30 a.m. the following morning. The communication with his mother stopped around 9.37 p.m., which his mother felt was odd since he didn't usually go to bed until 11 to 12 a.m., and Dylan was always on his phone. The following day on November 19th, Mark claims he woke up early around 7 a.m. to run errands at his attorney's office and the payroll office. In his official statement, he said he tried to rouse Dylan from his sleep and invited him to tag along, but Dylan refused, opting to sleep instead. So Mark left the home and didn't return until around 11 a.m., where upon his arrival, Dylan was no longer there, and neither were his black backpack or phone that he brought with him. This wasn't an uncommon occurrence, according to Mark, since Dylan often wandered around the nearby trails. So instead, he opted to take a nap for about an hour, and when Dylan still hadn't returned, he tried to contact him with no response. He reportedly went to Ryan's house, who didn't live very far from Mark. Ryan explains he texted Dylan at 6.45 in the morning and never received a reply. Unable to get a hold of his son, Mark goes and contacts authorities, claiming he is a missing person. Mark also texts Elaine to inform her of the situation. She immediately packs up her son, Corey, and the pair drive the six hours to assist in the search of her son. Police were concerned that Dylan might be a runaway. Rescue teams were deployed along with cadaver dogs. Around November 24th, the dogs picked up Dylan's scent near Vicedo Lake, so divers were deployed along with sonar equipment. These search efforts were fruitless, though. Nothing came up. No trace of Dylan was found. With passing days, Elaine began to question Mark's involvement more and more. In fact, she was convinced that he had something to do with their son's disappearance. No one was a person of interest at this point, but since Dylan had been staying with Mark, police did conduct a search of the home on November 29th. During this search, they did find Dylan's blood on the love seat, confirmed through DNA testing. No other forensic evidence was discovered at the time, and it was considered merely circumstantial, since Dylan had been staying at the home. The search continues into the following year, with more cadaver dogs being brought out, in February to search closer to Mark's property. During this same month, Elaine and Mark appear on Dr. Phil as a means of spreading Dylan's case to a wider audience, 
and to get answers from each other since the two hardly spoke other than text exchanges. The entire interview was really odd though. Mark spoke of his son in past tense any time he referred to him, and he also refused to take a polygraph test. His strange response seemed to only place Mark on the radar for investigators. On June 26, 2013, after seven months of searching, the partial remains of Dylan Redwine were discovered up Middle Mountain Road, directly off an ATV trail about eight miles from Mark's home. The following day after Mark was notified of Dylan's remains being discovered, his son and Dylan's half-brother reported an odd conversation the pair shared. Mark reportedly mentioned blunt force trauma several times in regards to Dylan's cause of death and stated investigators would have to find the rest of his body in order to confirm how he died. Many involved expressed concern that Mark may have hurt Dylan, even stating he admitted if he had to hide a body, he would leave it in the mountains. Mark was also known to violate the custody agreement on multiple occasions and even was heard saying he would rather kill the kid before letting her, meaning Elaine, have him. With growing suspicions, another search of his home was conducted, but this time with a canine. On August 5, 2013, a cadaver canine indicated the presence of a scent of a body in various locations of the home, including the living room and washing machine. The canine also indicated the same scent on his clothing worn the night of November 18th. On another visit in 2014, the same canine alerted the presence of human remains in his Dodge pickup truck, specifically in the bed of the truck. By this point, Mark had officially become a person of interest. On November 1st, 2015, about a mile and a half from the original recovery site on Middle Mountain Road, a couple of hikers discovered Dylan's skull. Mark reportedly had a history of violence, according to both of his previous wives. Not only was Dylan's blood found inside of his home, but it was well known the pair did not get along. Even in surveillance video from the airport, little to no personal interaction between the two can be seen. His brother Corey claims this may have stemmed from some compromising photos that the two of them found in 2011. While on a family trip with their father, the boys were using Mark's laptop inside of the hotel while he was asleep. They unfortunately stumbled upon pictures of Mark wearing women's lingerie and eating feces out of a diaper. Corey took pictures of these photos and kept them for a later date. He states that on that day, Dylan lost any reason to look up to Mark anymore, and he became very distant. During a later visit, Dylan became very upset with Mark when he talked negatively about his mother and brother. So in retaliation, Dylan decided to confront his father about the pictures. Family and investigators believe this was the shift in the father-son dynamic. Mark also showed little interest in the search efforts, opting to not join the parties in June of 2013. With a motive and evidence to back it up, a grand jury indicted Mark Redwine with the murder of Dylan. On July 22, 2017, Mark was arrested in Bellingham, Washington, where he was then extradited to Colorado to await trial. He has been imprisoned at the La Plata County Jail for the last three years on charges of second-degree murder and child abuse resulting in death. His trial has been postponed several times due to a variety of reasons. The first postponement occurred in November of 2018, followed by another in September of 2019 due to his attorney being arrested, and a third and fourth time in 2020 and 2021 due to the pandemic. But after seven long years of this case being dragged out, it has finally come to a close. The trial began in May of 2021 and lasted for several weeks. It took the jury less than eight hours to find Mark guilty on all charges on July 16, 2021. No one knows exactly what happened to Dylan Redwine on the night of November 18, 2012, 
and a formal cause of death cannot be determined. Sentencing is scheduled to take place on October 8, 2021, where he faces up to 48 years in prison for the murder of 13-year-old Dylan Redwine. Michael also took the time to provide me with an excerpt on his personal experience from the area after Dylan's remains were found. And I wanted to share that with you guys. He did give me permission to, so moving forward, this is all from his perspective. In the fall of 2016, I was scouting for an upcoming elk hunting season. I decided to take a drive up Middle Mountain Road, Forest Service Road 2274. It's an area not far from Durango, my home, but not an area I was that familiar with. When I made my turn onto 2274, my thoughts went to Dylan Redwine, a young local boy whose partial remains had been found recently in the general area I was driving into. His own father, Mark Redwine, was a suspect in the case, and it had been in the local news constantly. The dirt road turns and twists with many hairpin corners, with much of it in washboard condition. Ripples in the road that can lead to you completely losing control of your vehicle. I had climbed to nearly the top where the road levels out a bit, about 9,000 feet. I was heading down now into a valley, an area I had guessed from news reports where some of Dylan's remains had been found. My thoughts on him, sending him light and hoping he was in a good place. I was heading downhill towards a very sharp corner to the left when my right front tire exploded. It didn't go flat, it blew the outer portion of the tire off the rim. The truck swung to the right and went halfway off the road. I was sick to my stomach. If that had happened on that washboard corner, over the edge I would have went. It was close to a thousand feet or so to the bottom. I got out shaking. I saw Dylan's smiling face and I yelled, thank you Dylan, unsure of what compelled me to do so. Before changing the tire, I decided to walk down off the road and look at the valley below. The first thing I saw was a herd of elk, not far off, just staring at me like I was nuts. I was trying to absorb all of this when I noticed small flags stuck in the ground randomly. They were similar to what you would see for underground utilities, but the wrong color, and no utilities were within 20 miles of this spot. Then it hit me, or at least I'm pretty sure of it. They were the flags law enforcement used to mark findings while searching for evidence. I did later confirm what these flags were. At that moment, a feeling of darkness and horror like I'd never felt before crawled inside of me. I changed the tire and proceeded on to the end of the road. From that moment on, nothing in that area felt right. I went to the end of the road where I was going to hike a bit and couldn't get out of my truck. I've been in the woods all of my life, and I'd never before felt anything like that. I felt this one was good to go ahead and cover since it's relevant to our current time. This is one that we can actually keep up with, and also it's probably good to keep people updated in case anyone was interested, because I know this case was a little more popular and well-known because it got a lot of coverage, especially with them being on Dr. Phil. But I don't know how many people are actually following it. And it's nice to see that justice is being served for this little boy and his family. It's very tragic that this was at the hands of his own father. I can't, you know, I can never wrap my head around these cases where, especially parents who kill their children, it's insane to me. But once again, thank you, Michael, for asking me to cover this case. I'm definitely going to have to keep an eye out for the updates coming in October. I'm kind of curious as to how this was all going to play out. I also wanted to mention that those compromising photos, they can be found. I actually found them by accident when I was looking for pictures and things, and I wish I hadn't seen them because gross. Viewer beware, I would proceed with caution if you plan to at all. But as always, I am curious as to what your thoughts are on this case, so leave your comments below and we can chat about it. Please consider giving the video a thumbs up if you found it to be informational to let YouTube know you want more. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you guys, as always, for taking time out of your week to stop by. I appreciate each and every one of you. 
Thank you for making my week, and as always, I will see you in the next one. Bye, friends.